Amen. Amen. Um, I wanted to, I'm just going to preface this real quick. I'm going to skim through some stuff because I know there's a lot of people here this week that weren't last week. And I started a new series last week called Relationship is the Point. Last week I talked about an, a strong ending brings a strong beginning. Uh, how many of you know how you leave something is how you enter something? Whether or not the people, like a job for instance. I never really held down a lot. Of, this is the longest job I've ever had actually. So I'm doing pretty good. Seven, eight years, nine years. Wow, it's just, but I like it. And uh, sometimes, and so, <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you, there's no point in trying to lie. I'm in church, I'm a pastor, so I'm supposed to tell the truth. But anyway, I um, really, before this, I would quit jobs, start jobs, quit jobs, start jobs. I wasn't a good employee, but I was a good talker. Your mouth can get you in a lot of places that your character can't sustain. So I would get jobs, but then... Because I left the last job bad, that's the seed I went into the new job with. And so eventually that caught up to me, and my employer found out, well, he's not that good of an employee. He's just a good talker. But my point to that was, this is our first Sunday of the new year. It's important to let things go from last year and not say, don't carry the failure of 2000, or even in success, don't carry those things forward into this new year. Realize this is a new year. It's a new start. The, word, the number eight in the Bible actually means new beginnings. And so we're in 2018. This is actually, in, I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but in 2018, B.C. was supposedly the year that Abraham cut covenant with God. There was about 2,000 years between the beginning of the earth and, or not the earth, but the beginning of creation and Abraham, and then 2,000 years from then to, to Jesus. And now we're about 2,000 years afterwards. And so that signifies to me this year of covenant. It's a year of authority. So I'm uh, really looking forward to it. We're going to do some great things. The reason I'm talking about relationship is because it is so huge. And I've spent the last two weeks talking about forgiveness. I'm going to try to get through the rest of my stuff about forgiveness today. And so I'm not going to spend a long time reviewing. But before first service, I take communion before I speak just because I want to make sure the things I'm saying to you, they're from the Lord, not just my ideas. And I felt like what Jesus said to me about forgiveness. Because forgiveness is, let's don't, I mean, we're not going to try to sugarcoat this. It's not always easy to forgive people. It's just not. There's people I'm still dealing with forgiveness on. You say, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to forgive everybody. Yeah, you try that. <laughs> people do things. People hurt you. People say things. But you have to learn to walk in forgiveness. You have to learn to walk in mercy. So it's a daily thing. It's like working your salvation out. Once you get saved, that's just the beginning. You got to do it every day. Amen. Same with forgiveness, same with mercy. But I felt like Jesus said this to me earlier, and I don't mean I heard an audible voice, but inside I heard it. What people don't understand is that I faced the hardest moment humanity would ever have, and I overcame with forgiveness. There is nothing in your life that you have faced that was in any way, shape, form, or fashion similar to what Jesus faced. The difference is, for your worst moment and Jesus' worst moment, the biggest difference is you're guilty. And he was innocent. If anyone in humanity could have ever said no, if anyone could ever called for justice that they felt that people deserved, it would have been him. But we so often want justice, and that rightfully so. We want justice for the things that are done wrong. We want, and some of us really are justice people, we really want justice done for people who are innocent that had things done to them. And I think that that's an, a godly emotion. But what we got to be careful to, to realize is that we still see through a glass dimly. We don't understand pure justice like God does. But anyway, let's go on. Uh, I started, uh, and I'm just going to briefly say, uh, last week I talked about the uh, quantum physics just a little bit. The reason I'm telling you about it is because quantum physics deals with the unseen. Science as a whole or physics deals with things that are quantifiable or that can be added up or explained, right? And scientists for a long, long time stayed away from quantum physics because, anybody remember the show Quantum Leap? Amy and I were watching, we watched a little bit of uh, Back to the Future 3 last night. Anybody remember that show with, uh, you know, Michael Keaton? Is that his name? No. Thank you for that correction. Michael J. Fox. <clears throat> I realized that was, he was a really little guy. Uh, but anyway, 
and, uh, you know, Doc and the time machine and all that. It's all quantum physics. And the reason in the turn of the century people scientists stayed away from quantum physics so much was because it began because quantum physics deals with the unseen becoming seen, that's faith. And it began to explain God. And scientists, by and large, don't want to explain God. They don't want to God proved. They want things that you can see and to be able to explain it that way. Yeah. Well, quantum physics has made a comeback. It's kind of vogue now and everything. But there is a law in the quantum physics called the law of entanglement. Another word you could say for this is the law of relationship. Now, <clears throat> I got a good picture for you. Christmas lights. Entanglement. Yes. <laughs> Anybody ever see uh, a family vacation Christmas, Christmas vacation? He hands the big ball of lights to his son. Here, here, Russ, untangle those. <clears throat> well, it was an impossibility. It was a ball. It was tangled. It was terrible. And uh, now, you know, if you're good, then you wrap your lights correctly so that you can undo them. But in life, it's really hard to wrap things neatly so that we can use them again, sometimes we get entangled. And so this law of entanglement says that everybody, now true enough, I'll, I'll say this, everyone on the earth is connected. Yeah. Whether you've met them or not, there is a connection because you're on the earth. Yeah. So the earth is the common denominator, you're connected through it. But beyond that is relationship. Everybody has relationships. You can't name all of the ones you had or anything like that, but you're still connected to the people you had relationships with. So, <clears throat> if you maintain relationship with people or events that hurt you or that you were dealing with unforgiveness on or you've dealt with bitterness on, you maintain a strong connection with that person or event that still affects you today. I would even say that uh, relationships go beyond the grave because relationships are spiritual. Yeah. So, even if somebody dies but they hurt you, they still, they still hurt you from the grave. The only way to stop that is to forgive them. Yeah. To sever the connection and say, I'll no longer be affected by what they did to me, what they did around me. I'm going to release that to God. <clears throat> That's the law of entanglement. And so you got to understand that whether somebody's a thousand miles away or right next to you, it can still affect you. I said this, uh, I heard an old country preacher say one time, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. That's exactly what it is. <clears throat> okay, let's keep. Let's go through these pretty quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me, man. I did this last. Go to the next one, Jackie. Uh, we we kind of already said that. Let's go to the go and go to the next one. <clears throat> Relationship is the cornerstone of law of entanglement, and then you'll know what I just talked about is soul ties. Soul ties just means that your soul is entangled with somebody. Now, most people, people talk about soul ties. I was talking to a gentleman after service, and he was talking to me. Every time he's ever heard soul ties, it's all been about sex. But the truth is, soul ties can happen without, without even any contact, yeah. physical contact. Because when you give somebody a place in your life, there's been a tie to them. Yeah. And <clears throat> so we got to learn how to break soul ties, how to get past certain things in our life. I want to go to, um, let's see, where are we going to go first? We're going to go to Hebrews, um, let's see. You have your scripture sheets there, so you should be able to go with this. Um, let me see where, I really want to get to the end of this, so I'm trying to see what I need to cut out. <clears throat> you know, I was at uh, the Apple store yesterday, and you think, well, we're in church, so we're talking about forgiveness, that makes sense. <clears throat> I talk about this stuff everywhere. And I uh, was, something happened to my phone, I had to go in and get it fixed. And as I was standing there, we were, this guy and I were together for a few minutes and he asked me what I did. I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he said, oh, okay, well, what, what you know, started asking me little questions and I, you know, usually if anybody asks me what I do and then they don't, then they don't immediately stop talking to me, I feel like it gives me access to go ahead and say a few things. Sometimes people just stop. People do one of three things. They stop talking to you when they find out you're a pastor because they feel immediately guilty and want to get away from you, like you can do anything. Uh, number two, they say, oh, yeah, my dad's a deacon. 
as if somehow that connects us. And then uh, three, they start pouring their life out to you. And uh, I was, and this guy kind of started talking to me. And uh, I was talking to him about relationships and forgiveness. And he said that earlier in the year he had dealt with that, that he had become so wound up in unforgiveness with one event, one person, that it began to affect everything around him. His work environment, people he worked with, he saw everything that happened as negative. And so when you carry negativity in you all the time, based on one event, it begins to affect everything around you. Did you know that in your body, cells, all your cells are connected? The only cell in human makeup that is disconnected is a cancer cell. Cancer cells disconnect themselves and they become rogue cells. And then they begin to mastocize or spread themselves throughout all parts of the body. But it's because they're disconnected. Because usually when something bad happens in our life, we tend to isolate ourselves rather than insulate ourselves. We isolate ourselves from those that can help us rather than insulating ourselves with those who can bring peace and help to us. It's important to to remember because especially men, we get to a place where we kind of feel like, eh, I can take care of myself. It's not true. I've been pastoring eight years and just now starting to learn how important relationships are. That's pretty sad. I'm a slow learner, but I'm a quick study. So we have to form relationships with each other. And a few of the things that I said last week is one, unforgiveness blocks the spiritual good that the Lord wants to deposit into you. It's like a highway that has a wreck. And God wants to bring blessing into your life. But as he is bringing blessing, there are traumatic events. There's things that happen. You go and put the picture up, Jack. Uh, and we want to welcome any online guests we have. Glad you're here today. Um, everybody wave back. Do this kind of wave back at them. <clears throat> but anyway... In your life, it's life's like a highway. I think that's a country song. Um, <laughs> I actually listened to a country music this week. What? Yeah. Yeah, Holy Spirit moved. It was, it was yeah. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, but life is like a highway, and every once in a while, there's a wreck in your life. Now, depending on how close you are to the Lord is depending on how quickly the wreck gets cleared. Because you see that the traffic backed up with both of these things. Well, when we allow ourselves to forgive, when we do it by faith, because you don't always feel like forgiving. Come on, let's, you know, am I in the right place this morning? Sometimes you just do, I talk to, I mean, this, is, this hits everybody. People do things to you and you don't want to forgive. You want to hold on to it. Because for some reason you feel like if you don't hold on to it, you won't get justice. So God is the first responder with Rex. He comes in, he tries to tell you what to do. He tries to clear the Rex because he wants the love flow back in your life because you are the most optimum place of your life and and uh, uh, being effective when you are full of love, when you're allowing love to flow through you. And that's what brings the blessings into your life. And I want to uh, just say real quick, oftentimes we keep the Rex in our lives. You know how you keep a wreck in your life? You rehearse it all the time. Yeah. There's things that have happened to people years and years ago. They'd tell you the story. You'd think it had happened yesterday. Yeah. You know that to the brain there's no difference when you retell the story as when it originally happened? Because <clears throat> your brain, the brain center, uh, I could give you an example. I, I've cut my fingers a lot because I make knives, but I do things that lend themselves to skin not going good with metal. And I... Uh, I had a paper cutter one time I was doing something with. I put my hand down, pulled it up, and it cut the end of my thumb. And I mean bad, through the nail into the skin. Now, as I tell that, I feel it. (laughs) Somehow I feel it. Why? Because the receptors in your mind and the retelling of things brings the feelings back. And so when we have wrecks in our lives, when we have things that happen to us, that people did to us, whatever, we continue to talk about them. It just continues to bring those feelings back up. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be. He doesn't want you to release it. He wants you to hang on to it because he knows if he can get you to hang on to it, he can keep you bound up and ineffective in the kingdom of God. Now, so I want want us to learn to forgive so we can get the blessing flow back. And last week uh, I gave you scriptures. You can go back and listen to it. There's a lot I 
uh, scriptures I put to that point. Number two, unforgiveness and bitterness are proven to make you age quicker and support disease in your body. Why do people get ulcers? One of the main reasons people get ulcers. Worry, bitterness, stress. All fear, all fear-based. How come we don't get ulcers up here? It's not where we feel it. We feel it right here. So for every unresolved issue in your life that you hang on to and you give place, it will eventually make its way to the surface of your body because everything's spiritual. That's what quantum physics really proves, everything's spiritual. So if everything's spiritual, that means everything's unseen. Everything that's seen was once unseen. That is so easy to understand. Yeah. Ten years ago, these, didn't, these weren't even around really. Thermos was, had, the, had the market on these, right? Yeah. Today, what, what happened? What happened? Uh, what was the name of that? The one that? Yeti. Yeti? Yeti? Yeah. What kind of name is that? I mean, even Yeti. It means Bigfoot? It's Asian Bigfoot. Is it really? Yeah. You would know that, this Bigfoot person. <clears throat> you ever want to talk about Bigfoot? My wife knows everything. That or aliens, you know. Anyway, but now you can get one everywhere, and and actually Walmart sells some really good ones. But this was an idea before it was a reality. Why? Everything's spiritual. Some people think they have an original idea. They don't have an original idea. They just acted on it. Okay, so... Um, let's see. So that in, when we receive the love of Jesus all at once, that blood flows to the trauma of the past to unblock the highway of love. I want to tell you just real quickly, cause it's always ministers to people. I pull my knife out right now and I cut the end of my finger and I begin to bled to bled. <laughs> if I begin to bleed, which I would, cause I do have blood in me. Um, <clears throat> my blood wouldn't say, hang on a second before we go to fix this cut. We were going to find out, did Barry do this to himself or did someone else do it to him? Because if he did to himself, we are not going to heal him. A lot of people see Jesus that way. But you know that the blood in my body doesn't care whether I cut it or somebody else does it. All it does is go to the wound to heal it, to clog it up, to start mending it, to get it back. Did you know if most people would begin to stop, just stop talking about their past, they would be healed from their past? Because spiritual healing happens the same way. Yeah. It'd be like me. I heard a story of a little boy one time. He, he scraped his knee real bad, and there's this preacher that came to the house. And you know little boys, I mean, they just want to show you their boo-boos. Yeah. Why? Because they, oh, the boo-boo, you know, they want the sympathy. And so the little boy <clears throat> runs up to the preacher and says, look, and he pulls the bandage off, and it rips off all the healing with it. Well, it was fun to show it to the guy how bad it was. But if he'd left it on, it would have healed quicker. That's what a lot of people do when they keep talking about their past. They keep ripping the bandage off. Dummy, keep the bandage on. Let it heal. You know, people are really not interested in your hard times. Contrary to popular opinion, people are really not interested in knowing how bad it is. Okay, that went over great. But we are really accustomed to telling people how bad our lives are. We need to learn to talk about how good our lives are. And before you can really talk to someone else about how good it is, you need to get in the mirror and talk to yourself about how good it is. You can be your own best fan. Okay. All right. Now, this is the last one. This is really what I wanted to hammer on, and I've got a few things to go with it. All right. Number three, unforgiveness and bitterness exist because we don't believe justice will be served. I'll let that just settle in for a second. We've all been wronged and want equal justice for what was done to us. The problem with that is the ultimate act of forgiveness was given to an equally undeserving humanity. There's nobody that deserved forgiveness besides Jesus. Jesus is the only one who was able to say, I'm not going to forgive. We are in the position where we must forgive. Now, I say that because, (laughs) I say that because, 
according to the word, we don't have any spiritual standing to hold back from forgiveness, forgiveness from somebody else. That's right. Now, this is where it gets a little tough, okay? This is where it kind of got quiet last service. But go to Isaiah, in your scriptures there, Isaiah 118 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Is it, don't raise your hand, has it ever been said of you that you're a real stubborn person? <clears throat> Amy and I <clears throat> both walk in this gift, <clears throat> especially when it's an argument. But did you know that in, um, where is it, 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is idolatry. Stubbornness is the worship of your own opinion. When you're so stubborn that you won't move, you're worshiping your own opinion. Actually, you're valuing your word or circumstance above the word of God and saying, I'm right, Jesus is wrong. Now, we would never say that with our mouth, but we do it with our actions quite often. Now, I know this isn't jump up and down, do cartwheels and all that kind of stuff, but this does bring freedom. Yes. If you listen to it and get through it, it'll bring you some freedom. Jesus had to be willing and obedient to go to the cross and shed his blood, otherwise... It wouldn't have worked. Yeah. Jesus could not have provided for us to eat the good of the land if he was not willing to go to the cross, but he was only obedient. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that it was Jesus' willingness to go to the cross that got him through the cross. So Obedience only gets you so far. That scripture I quoted in 1 Samuel was the prophet Samuel saying to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. He was in, Saul had done some things that were, that were wrong. But if Jesus had gone to the cross and only been willing, then we wouldn't be able to eat the good of the land. Yeah. Because he wouldn't have been obedient to the Father. Isaiah was a prophet speaking from the Lord. So Jesus had to not only be obedient but willing. And have you ever told your kids to take something to the trash or gave them a chore to do? They were obedient, but they stomped their feet the whole way. Stomping the feet means unwilling, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> Or giving you a nasty look. You know that there are these things called spankings. I'm just not sure if everybody knows about them or not. Uh, we raised our children in the nurture and the admonition of the rod. And uh, I'm just, of the Lord. This is one, this is the one that got the le least spankings probably. My son, who's helping in children's church now, is the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> I, I, wore, I wore paddles out with my parents. I mean, and my dad believed firmly in Proverbs 29, 18. <clears throat> he had a, a, he had one made. It was about this long, had a handle on it. And it had that scripture, the rod bringeth wisdom. And so none of you will ever see my rear end. But before branding was cool, it just says odd bringeth wisdom. On, on. <laughs> I was just playing I'm just playing. I've been healed. Maybe I need to forgive, forgive my father. That's what I'm feeling. Father, in the name of Jesus. No, I'm just playing. All right. Jesus asked three times for the cup to be removed. Each time he said, not my will, but yours be done. He was more interested in the will of God than he was the will of him. Yes. Amen. Anton LaVey wrote the book, The Satanic Bible. Does anybody know what the first commandment of the Satanists are? Do what thy will, yeah. do what you want, do thy own will. Yeah. Doing thy own will is the best way to fail in life. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that during break in between services, how somebody could actually write a satanic Bible and not even, maybe even get saved in the middle of doing it. You had to be really delusional, really possessed. Yeah. I mean, just even a person with a half a brain knows if you live your life by do thy own will, somebody's going to kill you or you're going to kill somebody. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Anyway, I got to move on. So my point is that the willingness of our life has to do a lot with 
how well we do with the Lord. So, uh, in all humanity, from beginning to end, Jesus was the only one ever qualified to ask the question for the cup to pass because he was the only one without sin. So, here's the, the statement. We all, or I'm sorry, we have no spiritual standing to demand justice through equality of pain and suffering if we believe our evil is forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Just think about it for a second. If he experienced the worst of all humanity and we don't forgive, we're saying what we experienced is worse than what he did. Yeah. Well, you don't know what they did to me. You're right, I don't. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it didn't hurt. I'm not saying that there aren't feelings at all. I'm just saying that worse has been done and worse was forgiven. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I'm, not saying that you, that you're, I'm not saying you're bad if you don't forgive. I'm not saying anything like that. But <clears throat> what's interesting is that the same mercy that God gives us is the very thing that covers our delay after the fact. I, case in point, things have happened this year that I didn't like, that hurt, and all this other stuff. Well, my obedience to forgive is a command. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's a command, I didn't command it. If I didn't command it, I'm not responsible for it. All I'm responsible to do is to obey the command. Yeah. Now, see this. This gives you, this gives you, this gives you you're off the hook. Because as long as you hold on to bitterness, unforgiveness, or anything else, what you're doing is you're maintaining the connection with the person or the event that hurt you, but you're also stifling any creativity, stifling any flow of the presence of God in your life. Because I'm going to show you something in, in the service talking about the blood of Jesus. It is impossible, impossible, impossible to live in the presence of God without living in the mercy of God. That's so good. So good. And I want to tell you, one of the first people you have to learn to forgive is you. You have not done anything so bad that you cannot be forgiven. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, as the pastor of this church, Amen. speaking for the Lord, you have not trespassed so much yeah. that you cannot be forgiven. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Unless you forgive you, you won't forgive others because you won't have forgiveness to give. Yeah. You just got to learn to forgive yourself, man. You are not that bad. I had someone tell me in between services, I'm a POS. A lot of you know what that means. You got to get out of that mindset. You are not a piece of, you are a prince yeah. of the spirit. See, I just changed it. Prince of spirit. <clears throat> Instead of piece of. Yeah. So you are a, you're a prince or a princess of the most high God. That's who you are. If you said yes to Jesus, because his blood immediately went to the wound, whether you did it or not, That's right. and began to heal it. That's right. Can I get an amen? amen? Even for those you don't know what amen means, say amen. All right. <clears throat> we have no spiritual standing to demand justice. Now listen. Oh, this is, this, okay, all right. I've got to slow down. If we did have the right to demand justice, it would mean that Jesus' blood was not sufficient for the whole of humanity. Hebrews 6, 4. For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again them for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Jesus is not crawling back up on the cross. Yeah. No matter how big you think your foul up was. You know what this is saying? You're forgiven. Yes. Quit acting like you're not. All right. Romans 6, 8. So let me let's read this to you. Let's read it together. Now if we died in Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Amen. There, death no longer has dominion over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives in to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. 
And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves as God to God as being alive from the dead, and your mem members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but you're under grace. You're under grace. Mm -hmm. And I read the wrong scripture. I was supposed to read Romans 12, 18. So let's just bump down there because it's good. Well, let's just, just read Matthew while we're there. Matthew 10, 7 says, And as you go preach, say, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Nobody here paid for their salvation. You didn't pay to be forgiven. So why do you make other people pay for it? Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with some men. All, A-L-L, -L, all men. You know what all means in Greek? All. <clears throat> That's thought it was funny. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. It is okay when you don't avenge yourself and you put it into the hands of God, you have given place to wrath. Wow. Now, we're not talking about the wrath of Khan. We're not talking about some weird wrath that the world tells us. To. We're talking about pure wrath, which, when seen coming, makes, puts people in a place to change. Yeah. But your wrath is not pure. Wow. My wrath is not pure. Yeah. Why? Because I don't know the whole story. Yeah. I don't know everything about the person or the event or whatever. But it goes on to say, Give place to wrath for its, for its written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Do you know that if you begin to try to repay, you have taken jo God's job, and God, go ahead, God must recover any outstanding debts. Yes. When you take, oh, and it moves to the next one. When we don't, we don't want the Lord responsible to make right what we had the obligation to forgive. In other words, if you hold forgiveness back, God must account for that. I don't know what that accounting looks like, and I don't want being the numbers. Didn't the Lord's Prayer say, or uh, was it Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, 25? Ask whatever you want. When you stand praying, forgive. Yes. Yes. If anyone has ought against you, yes. or if you have ought against anyone, make it right. Because if you forgive, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. If you don't forgive, He won't forgive you. Man, that's serious. Yes. And I don't want to know. I, I asked my dad one time, do you think God's really serious? He won't forgive us? He said, well, I find out. <laughs> but I test it. Just forgive. <laughs> let, me, let me let you off the hook real quick. You don't have to feel like forgiving to forgive That's right. you can still have the feelings i'm gonna go i'm gonna stretch here okay you can still have feelings of hate and forgive somebody let me explain it just real quickly kenneth hagan said this you can have faith in your heart with doubt in your head see to forgive is faith because you don't feel like it yeah. because it's in the future it hasn't happened yet but you're doing it by faith. See, your feelings may not line up with what you say, but eventually they will. Right. Yeah. I heard someone give a testimony. I'm, I'm, I just got to finish this so you can give me just a few more minutes. I heard someone say this. They had been abused by their father. They were actually in a, in a cult, a Satanist thing, and they were on, online to be you know, one of those people that were sacrificed. I mean, it was bad. And they told, they told me, I had to forgive him little by little. I have a statement up there, <clears throat> and it's something like this. Just because you have to forgive somebody more than one time doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're trying. And God knows the frailty of humankind. He knows that our mind is not renewed like his. And he knows that on the process of renewal, we're going to have to do things over and over and over and over and over let me, let me say this. Repetition makes reputation. Wow. Repetition makes reputation. Yeah. So you need to have a reputation for forgiveness. Yeah. 
when we walk in mercy, we walk in forgiveness, we develop a reputation. It becomes, you know, the more you forgive, it becomes easier to forgive. Now, listen, I'm not saying if you've been done wrong and you forgive that person that you let them right back into your life either. Don't be stupid. If I go through that back door and every time somebody hits me with a baseball bat and I forgive them each time, keep going through the door, I need to have my head examined. There's some people that need to be out of your life. You need to forgive them, sever the connection, let them heal, let you heal, and see if God brings you back together because he knows the best. Amen? All right. As we, as we get close to closing here, just let me say this, a few things. Forgiveness is supernatural. It's pretty much what I just said. Um, in Ephesians 2.10, it says that we have a good life to discover and find in the Lord's on your sheet right there. But you cannot have the fullness of the goodness of God in your life without walking in mercy. You realize that mercy was the door that got us into salvation. Okay? I'm going to prove it out here in just a second. Okay. Forgiveness sets the stage for others to follow your lead. If I, as a pastor, <clears throat> walk in bitterness and unforgiveness towards people, whether you know it or not, whether even if you were not a real bitter person, I will leak that. I'll leak it in my language. I'll leak it spiritually. And eventually it'll make it its way into the congregation. Yeah. You look at... There's one congregation, I'm not going to say the name, but there's a pastor, all he does is beat on other pastors. Every time he, every chance he gets, he talks hateful about Joel Osteen, hateful about Kenneth Copeland, hateful about this one, that one, tries to find scriptures that fit his doctrine. You got to be careful with that kind of stuff. But what happens is, because he's infected with bitterness, his congregation is infected yes. with bitterness. Yeah, you're right. So it's my job to walk in forgiveness so that our congregation walks in forgiveness. Amen. So it walks in mercy yeah. because we want a good and bright future. Amen. Amen. So first, second Corinthians two, nine says, whoever you forgive, I forgive. Paul said that so whoever you forgive, I forgive. You know, when you're, when you're, you're a parent and your children see you go through something, you may not think they're watching, but they're watching. And they've learned from you whether to forgive people later on in life. Yeah. Where you lead, they will follow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Last thing, forgiveness prepares individuals, families, and churches for an outpouring of the presence of God. <clears throat> Saw this now more than ever. I just, if we want the presence of God, which we say we do, if we want revival, which we say we do, it will not come without mercy. Impossible. Go ahead and put the picture up. This is an Old Testament representation of the presence of God. On the top, you'll see two angels with their wings outstretched, touching each other, guarding the presence of God. Cherubim <clears throat> is what they're called. Now, in the Old Testament, this represented the presence of God. And here's what would happen. They would carry it from place to place to place. It's a representation of the presence, but also it had an area around it, which is the Holy of Holies. Then outside it, it had another area, and it had a whole tent for it. What would happen is each year, the priest would come in one time, and every time the priest came in to be around the Holy of Holies, what he would do is bring in a blood sacrifice, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat is what is right under the wings. That's the mercy seat of God. You can't get to the presence that's inside the ark without going through the mercy. Yeah. In fact, you can't stay in the presence unless you're under the mercy. So you can't have the blessing if you're not the blesser. Right. Yeah. Okay? So, in this ark were three things. One was the manna, which signifies God's provision. Two was the rod of Aaron signifies growth and maturity. The other thing was the Ten Commandments, which signified order. And <clears throat> it's interesting that five commandments, five or four, anyway, the commandments are almost split down the middle on our relationship with God yeah. and God's relationship with man or our relationship with man. Yeah. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't covet. Those are things we don't go to God. We don't covet God. We don't steal from God. We do it with each other. 
don't have any other lords before me. That's me and him. Don't kill is me and you. Yeah. See that? <clears throat> so it had those three things. It represented the presence of God. Now, in your, the last scripture you have there is in Hebrews. It's different. <clears throat> in Hebrews 9, 11, it says, But Christ came as high priest. Just leave the picture up there. Thanks, Jack. But Christ, Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself with no spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. I know it's a lot, but it's important. In the Old Testament, before the high priest went in to sprinkle the blood, he had to be pure physically. In other words, he had to be completely clean. Yeah. Something interesting happened with Jesus. Now, when Jesus hung on the cross, I don't believe that the blood was left at Golgotha. I don't believe it was left on the cross. I believe that the precious, spotless blood was supernaturally retained. And Jesus went before the high priest, as the high priest, yes. to the mercy seat yes. of the real tabernacle, yes. of the real mercy seat. Yes. And he offered his spotless blood to his father. Yes. So I get chill bumps thinking about it. See, it's supernatural how it happened. The blood still remains. It's still there as proof that nothing is impossible because now the Father sees us through the blood. The interesting thing was the high priest couldn't go in unclean to the Holy of Holies. Jesus couldn't go in unclean. Something really interesting happened when he was raised from the dead he was around the graveside and mary magdalene not mary the mother of jesus but mary magdalene the prostitute was there she grabbed hold of him and he said don't cling to me for i'm not yet glorified i'm clean i just went to hell i just took care of everything and i came back i'm clean i gotta go be glorified don't hang on to me but her touching him didn't spoil the cleanliness. The cleanliness spoiled the sin. The first person to touch Jesus physically out of the womb was Mary the virgin. The last person to touch him before he went to glory was Mary the prostitute. If that doesn't show the grace and mercy of God, I don't know what does. He went to heaven, presented his blood, became glorified, came down, spent 40 days walking among, touching eating. Guys, this mercy thing's huge. And if we want the presence of God, we got to have the mercy and we got to stay in mercy. Mm -hmm.